There it is. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> right. So my name is Phil. Um, I've done previous co-ops in biotech and batteries. My name is Heather. I've done co-ops in the biotech industry, semiconductors, and the food and beverage sector. My name is Wasim. I've done previous co-ops and internships in wastewater. I'm Niall. Uh, I've done co-ops in nanotechnology and biotechnology uh, with a particular focus in process development. I'm Mohammed. I did my co-ops in the oil and gas industry. So, in the United States, um, according to the American Home Brewers Association, um, they did a survey um, among a bunch of different home brew stores um, across the nation, and they found that 1.1 million people are currently home brewing in the United States. Um, and of that 1.1 million people, about 40% of it, uh, so 440,000, just started in the last two years. That makes 440,000 people who don't necessarily know everything that they're doing um, are novice amateur um, home brewers. Um, so we'd like to help them out a little bit. Brewing as a process starts with um, malt. You have your, uh, your grain, what you're using, so usually barley. Uh, you're adding it to hot water, extracting a bunch of starches. Um, activating enzymes that are found on those husks uh, with heat, um, breaking down those starches into more simple sugars, uh, which then you add hops to it and uh, boil it and then add your yeast. Um, and your yeast is turning those simple sugars into carbon dioxide, um, the bubbles in your beer and alcohol, the fun in your beer, right? Um, so at the end of that process, you have beer, um, but it's green beer, um, which means that it's not really finished beer, green kind of like an unripe banana, right? Um, so there's some things that you want to get out of it um, after this process. So you're going to do conditioning. Um, in our case, you're going to bottle condition your beer in order to get it to the correct carbonation level. So you want it to be palatable, you want it to be carbonated. Um, and this is a very um, key aspect of this process and one that we focused on um, for our project. So like I said, um, following your uh, primary fermentation, you have your green beer. You have beer that's not fully carbonated. Um, and this process um, can be uh, kind of clunky for a home brewer. So um, different ways that they will carbonate their beer is you can kegerate your beer, you can uh, use forced carbonation, um, but for a home brewer that, uh, that includes a lot of capital costs, a lot of things um, like uh, initial investment, uh, especially for a novice home brewer, you're not gonna wanna um, commit to that kind of purchase. Um, you have to have a lot of space to, to store all of that stuff in. Um, so a lot of novice home brewers will bottle condition their beer. Um, in doing that, you're adding uh, priming sugar, which is very simple sugars, um, and relying on um, suspended yeast within your culture, um, which has already gone through a full fermentation and like kind of gone to sleep, so flocculated out to the bottom. So you're relying on that to uh, work to carbonate your beer, um, which can have uh, variability issues um, uh, bottle to bottle and batch to batch. Um, so a successful solution to this problem would be one that, ha that produces reliable carbonation levels for your beer um, that, uh, that does not vary from bottle to bottle and batch to batch. Um, you would reach the desired carbonation level for um, whatever kind of beer you're making. Um, you would decrease the contamination opportunities because this step does happen um, right when you're bottling your beer. Um, you don't want any kind of uh, wild yeast or lactic acid bacteria to get in there. There's nothing that can grow in beer that can harm the human body. If you're getting sick from beer, it's a qu uh, quantity issue, not a quality issue. But you don't want to be changing the flavor of your beer at all. Um, so you want to minimize the amount of things that can get in there and change that flavor. Um, and then the other thing that we would want to do a solution uh, for this problem would be to increase improve the handling of this entire process. So Prime Pack, um, our company, our mission, our vision is to um, pr create a product that, uh, that produces a reliable uh, level of carbonation for, um, for home brewers with the, um, with the uh, use of uh, additional yeast and sugar um, in the bottles. Um, we're really here to help home brewers with this one main goal, and that is to brew good beer every time. Um, the company aims to manufacture some tabletized yeast and sugar product um, that is then added to um, the added to the bottles, um, and then it would be distributed uh, with the help of a manufacturer's representative. Um, and we, of course, want to break even uh, the first year and then become more profitable um, following. All right, so getting into some of the initial ideas we had to uh, 
solve this carbonation problem. Our first was a handheld forced carbonation device. So a user would fill their bottle of beer and then using the small like airsoft CO2 canisters, they would inject CO2 into their beer directly in the bottle and then cap it. And they would just do this for a batch, kind of like a personalized soda stream for each bottle. So you just go down the line, fill, uh, carbonate, and cap. Uh, this allows the user to have bottles that are ready for consumption or sharing, like essentially immediately. Normal bottle conditioning takes three to four weeks. Um, <clears throat> our second idea was to improve upon bottle conditioning uh, using a sugar and yeast combined tablet and packaging it in the form factor of a blister pack so users can just pop uh, tablets directly into the bottles as they've been filled. Um, our third iteration of the idea uh, was uh, packaged separately but sold together. So this is either uh, terrible packets or separate blister packs. And then our final idea that we generated was uh, packaged together but divided packaging. And so getting into some of the reasons what that or some of the reasons why we moved away from some of these initial ideas are um, for the forced carbonation device, uh, our glass bottles that beer is typically uh, brewed in have a 40 PSI pressure limit before rupture. Um, and the pressure required to hit your desired carbonation level is 30 to 35 PSI. Uh, and with bottles being reused, you can't necessarily guarantee that they're going to have the original uh, safety specification of 40 psi um, and carbonating in a or force pressurizing in a glass container at home is a huge safety challenge to overcome so that's why we moved away from that. Uh, idea B is kind of the ideal solution of the yeast and sugar uh, tablet. Um, however, that requires a stability study uh, since yeast eats sugar. Uh, you want to ensure that your product does not change after it's been packaged. Um, and so within the scope of this project, uh, stability study is really infeasible due to the amount of time. Um, and it also has a complex tabletization unit operation. Uh, the yeast is going to be more susceptible to pressure than sugar. And when you're combining two different materials with different structural properties, uh, you might say damage the yeast. Um, and then option D, uh, this had a really complex operation on the user side. Uh, so a user either has to somehow tear off the entire packet, fit all of the contents into a particular bottle, or do like a half rip, put in the yeast for all the bottles, other half rip, put in the sugar for all the bottles. Too many operations, so what we ultimately ended up with is a uh, packaged uh, separately but sold together. So a user will take a blister pack of sugar, do all their bottles at once, and then all of their bottles with yeast with the separate blister pack. And so now we have a product idea, we need to make sure that it works. Um, so what we wanted to do was characterize the variability in carbonation with a uh, standard method, as well as uh, with additional yeast, and to determine the effect of yeast concentration on carbonation levels. So with a fixed amount of sugar, uh, does having a different concentration of yeast lead to a different final level of carbonation? Um, so what we did is we brewed a batch of homebrew to generate green beer. Uh, we wanted to do this as opposed to just uh, mimicking it with sugar and water so that we get the actual culture media that this fermentation is going to occur in. And then we had an arm that we pasteurized to kill all the yeast for a baseline. So we add the sugar, there's no yeast in there. What does our carbonation level come out to? And then we bottled uh, without killing the yeast, our control. Um, so no additional yeast using the yeast left over from primary fermentation. And then we added uh, 0.2 grams of yeast to each bottle and 0.4. So control would be one relative amount of yeast. Uh, the next 0.2 would be uh, double yeast and uh, 0.4 would be triple yeast and no yeast would be zero. So going into the data, um, we measured the volume of our bottles after three to four weeks of bottle conditioning. We measured the volume of CO2 released by gas displacement. Um, and we performed a one-point calibration with uh, soda. It had, it had a known carbonation level, so we used that to adjust our scale um, to get a volume of CO2 out as opposed to volume of CO2 released, so carbonation volume as a proper unit. And so our takeaways is that we saw that adding yeast reduced variability when compared to control. So we see with the two and three amounts of relative yeast, 
the uh, standard deviation, so the error bars there, are smaller than the one amount of relative yeast, which is our control. So that's good. Our sample size for that was five to six bottles for each. Um, the variability, what's interesting, it doesn't seem to further reduce with increasing yeast concentration. So uh, two amounts of relative yeast and three amounts of relative yeast appear to have the same standard deviation. Um, so that perhaps maybe we could use less yeast um, and achieve the same reduction in variability. And then what we do find is that yeast concentration does seem to have an effect on carbonation level. As you can see, they, uh, they don't taper off completely to a set level. There's not just a threshold. Um, there is some influence on final carbonation volume. However, um, the propagation of this yeast in the bottles is uh, tied directly to dissolved oxygen content. And that's not necessarily something you can control for. Different home brewers are going to uh, introduce different amounts of oxygen. So, one home brewer might have a good process that doesn't introduce any, and another home brewer might over-oxygenate. So what we really want to do is fine-tune this final carbonation level with the sugar component. It's a lot simpler. So based on these findings, we developed a process diagram that starts with introducing our yeast starter culture, and that propagates, which essentially means making more yeast in a propagation reaction. From that, we want to separate our yeast from the other contents of our reaction, which is mainly water. And that starts with a rotary filtration, which separates most of our water from our yeast. And then extrusion to get our yeast in the right form factor, which is a tablet. Followed by drying to make sure it stays in that solidified form factor of a tablet. And finally, uh, packaging to make sure that, or to give the consumer an optimal way to um, access their yeast through a blister pack and that is combined with a sugar tablettization process. So we're gonna have separate sugar and yeast tablets. And there's a detailed PFD with streams in our appendix slides. So here you can see how much yeast we expect to recover. We start with about uh, 3,100 units of yeast. So we'll call that like our 100%, and that's right after propagation. And the following separation processes, uh, filtration, extrusion, drying, and using the blister packs, that those each take a certain percentage of our yeast away through uh, manual transfer uh, and whatnot. So we end up with about 58% of our uh, original product, which gives us about 1,800 <coughs> sellable units per run of the reactor. So here you can see our more detailed PNID. We start with uh, the boiler, which is where we make our wort, and that's just introducing sugar and water, breaking it up to 100 degrees C, and um, creating wort followed by two heat exchangers to bring it back down to about 25 degrees C, so room temperature. And here's what our most, one of our most crucial control systems is uh, making sure that temperature is about 25 degrees C before going into our two reactors, because if it's not at that right temperature, it could potentially damage our yeast in the long run. So um, yeah, we have a control system that sends the, if the wort is not at the right temperature, it'll just send it back to the boiler so it can go through the heat exchangers again. Um, so we have uh, the reactors here, which is where the wort meets our yeast and the propagation reaction occurs. And um, after the reaction occurs, we have a glycol chiller, which will, cause, which will cause yeast flocculation. So we'll run glycol through the jacket of the reactor and uh, cool it down to flocculate the yeast out. And that runs for about eight hours. So the reason we have two reactors is because we want to do intermittent runs of a flocculation and reacting. So while one is reacting, the other one has already reacted and is flocculating that yeast out with the glycol chiller. So after that flocculation process, the yeast that remains is sent to, as I said before, the rotary dryer, and that extracts most of our water here. And here's another important control system which uh, maintains the level of the rotary dryer because if it gets too high, it could overwhelm the dryer. And again, it's followed by the extruder to get in the right form factor, the dryer to make sure it stays solidified in that form factor. And then here it meets the sugar in a blister pack, a blister packaging machine. And uh, the sugar comes in its own tabletization press and then they're both packaged together. So some safety concerns. The biggest concern we have is contamination because we're working with live yeast. And this would be evident based on the look and smell of the yeast. So the biggest thing we have to think about is operator awareness, because they're the ones going to be dealing with our yeast day to day. So they have to, be, they have to know what to look for in terms of contamination. 
but we will also be uh, conducting pore plating tests to see if there's any other bacteria in our yeast. Uh, in regards to runaway reactions or overpressurization, it's not very likely with this reaction, but we are using pressurized oxygen in a, like a metal tank, so it's we have to be we have to consider the safety of overpressurization. So we uh, do include relief valves in our conical fermenters, and we have vents in those fermenters. Uh, the chemicals we're using are carbon dioxide, oxygen, hydrochloric acid, and sodium hydroxide. So in regards to oxygen especially, flame and ignition sources, sources need to be kept away from the fermentation and oxygen tanks. And um, for HCL and NaOH, uh, the operators need to use PPE. Uh, those materials are used for cleaning, so whenever they're cleaning the equipment, they have to use gloves, goggles, aprons, and uh, face protection. And also, eye wash stations and emergency showers should be located centrally in the plant. And we also want to include separate and isolated storage for all of those materials. So we conducted an FMEA at our original PNID to uh, examine if there's any gaps in our process safety. And what we found is first that we needed to include a carbon monoxide and dioxide detector to uh, just ensure the safety of everyone involved in the process on the plant floor. And uh, we had some issues with our flow path as well. Um, there are some examples where we had a fail closed valve and just a pump was could continuously pump into that valve were it to close. So we had to adjust our control system to account for that to automatically switch off the pump were that to happen. And we also had a remediation for contamination again. Uh, contamination is our biggest risk. So we did uh, include quality control and other detection methods to uh, reduce that risk of contamination. And um, a lot of our equipment requ requires servicing and cleaning, so we wanted to include isolation valves so that we could isolate those, the equipment that needs to be cleaned at any time. And finally, we found that uh, our electrical equipment would require an emergency shutoff system. So with regards to environmental safety, our biggest concern is our wastewater. We will be treating our wastewater for pH. It comes out at about a, a pH of 4.5, but we want to bring it up to about 5.5 to safely dump it. So we'll, we're going to be neutralizing it with sodium hydroxide. And uh, the, biolog the biological oxygen demand of the water needs to be considered because the, the water we're using has a high level of sugar in it. So that is a lot of nutrients that could be sent to a treatment facility and potentially uh, cause them harm. So. Um, that definitely needs to be considered, but the scale of our production is so small where it would be pretty negligible were it to be sent to uh, a treatment facility. But uh, as a precaution, we're including a, fo a flow meter on our um, wastewater stream to just monitor the amount of water we're actually sending out in the dump. <clears throat> so now to drill into the business plan. So we plan on setting our company up as an LLC that we decided to do this because if we do need to raise any capital, we are planning on taking out loans. We do not want any to deal with stock options or to deal with investors or anything in the stock market. And LLC also um, offers us as owners protection over our personal assets. And finally, in the future, should we decide to make any changes within internally within the board? So let's say we want to add a new partner or we want to form a partnership with an established company, setting up as an LLC will give us the flexibility to do so. We decided to set up the company in Kentucky. That's because we established that Kentucky strategically placed uh, in a location where we can reach most of our target market. It's essential to our business model because we plan on shipping our products through the use of UPS. So um, having um, a location on the target market will allow us to ship them at lower costs. So we have two primary go-to market strategies. One of them is we aim to strike a partnership with established companies that uh, provide starter packets for new home brewers to, to um, have our product with them. This will also help us establish ourselves in the market through word of mouth and help us make a presence in the market. And as I mentioned before, we plan on shipping our products after manufacturing through UPS, using UPS. So a little bit on intellectual property. Initially, the problem was identified by Heather and Mal. The rest of us just helped them with conducting the market research, brainstorming, etc. We established that our company does not have a unique solution or a unique um, uh, value, but what we do have is a unique know-how with the optimal ratio of sugar and yeast concentration. So we established that for our case, the most ideal intellectual property to apply for is a trade secret. 
we aim to keep this ratio confidential to keep us at a competitive to have a competitive advantage over our competitors. In the future, we do aim to have a product line for different types of beers, and we will apply for an IP in the future. Um, we did not use any resources to uh, Northeastern. All of the experiments were done in house. So a little bit on the business model. Our unique value proposition is we have a product that contains an optimal ratio of yeast and sugar concentration that allows uh, home brewers to consistently reach the side carbonation levels. Our distribution is going to be through the starter packs, as I mentioned, and through using UPS. We're going to have two intermediates with our distribution channels. We're going to have a sales rep that allows us to, that helps us initiate these talks with the larger companies and also helps us market with marketing. Uh, we'll have two primary revenue streams, which is selling our product to the retail stores and through the st uh, having our product in the starter packs. So to really drill down our target market, we decided to use a filtration model. So initially, we identified there are approximately 1.1 million home brewers. We expect that number to increase in the future. We also established that more experienced home brewers may not want to use our product. So therefore, we really drilled down a number of the number of new home brewers which came out to approximately 440,000. We also identified that approximately a uh, home brewer visits a store eight times a year. So we decided to, uh, we assumed that they would buy our product five times a year when calculating our revenue streams, which Phil will get into. But briefly, we took three different forecasts uh, based on uh, what we expect our target, uh, what percentage of the target market we expect to get for our revenue projections. So digging a bit deeper in competition, we identified that the three target, uh, three, three competitors that are really um, dominant in the market, home brewing and Cooper's offers just sugar tabs that um, home brewers just put in their um, bottles. The difference between them two is that uh, they differ in sizes. So usually those who have larger bottles will go for Cooper's, and those who have smaller bottles go for home brewing. But uh, reading through the comments and the feedback from their customers, the issues they have is. Uh, to do with the reliability, usually depending on what they have, they usually have either under, carbon under carbonation or over carbonation. Carbocap also similarly has something um, has something for uh, home brewers to carbonate their beer, but the first slightly what they have is a cartridge that you put into your um, beer that, car that injects CO2. The problem with that is that uh, the customers have to deal with large pressures and they have to use plastic bottles when um, carbonating it, which is not ideal which brings us to Prime Pack, which offers a novel solution of the optimal yeast and sugar content for our product. Uh, so going to our target market, of, of the new home brewers, uh, going with a conservative estimate of just 5% of them would buy our product with an optimistic 10% just at the beginning of when we first starting. And then a lot of our numbers are based off like a realistic uh, in the middle of 7%. Uh, so the pie chart on the left is just like a cost breakdown. Uh, we have our labor and rent being the most expensive, uh, with a lot of our equipment being cheap, our sales rep being cheap. Just uh, On the right is our uh, net present value graph uh, based on our year. Um, the bottom line is uh, targeting 5% of our target uh, market, and then the middle line, the white line, is 7% of our target market. And then the top line is 10%. Uh, and this, uh, how well we do, very, uh, it's going to be based on how well our customers like it. So we did a range uh, with the 7% being our middle, which was uh, fits our goal of breaking even after uh, one year. Uh, so our median profit after taxes for that 7% is 65000 and then for our second year and the continuing years would be $120,000 um, a year. Uh, so in conclusion, we have this supplies an unmet need. Uh, for our, pro our product supplies an unmet need to customers, especially new um, home brewers. Our proof of concept shows that this is viable. Uh, we do re reduce variability. Uh, and then using conservative uh, even with conservative figures, we will be making a profit. Um, for conservative figures, we'll break even after a year and a half. With our uh, more optimistic, we could break even after half a year. Uh, we'd like to thank Don Wood through his very quick feedback and his Connors meetings.
<laughs> and we'd like to thank Professor Fluger for her feedback also in designing this course. Thanks. Any questions? Do you have a, uh, a good idea as to how the, uh, the current market <clears throat> deals with product that is uh, not up to expectation? In other words, this variability that you're trying to eliminate mm -hmm. uh, can either result in the stuff getting thrown away or doesn't taste as good we gotta drink it anyway. <laughs> in other words, how much how much beer do you save uh, through the use of this particular product? Or do you, or do you have a sense for that? Uh, yeah, so it's not really so much about saving beer. Um, your home brewer is typically not going to throw out an entire batch because it's a lot of work that went right. into it, and it's usually drinkable. Yeah. Um, but this, our product allows them to be proud of sharing their beer. Like, you know, part of home brewing is you want to share it with your coworkers, your friends. Okay. Um, you can, like, give bottles to people. Uh, so our product helps them be proud of the beer that they're creating, as well as uh, reducing confounding issues. So the taste, like, if you have an uncarbonated beer, issues of taste are going to be confounded by carbonation issues um, so you're not going to be able to assess you know batch to batch or refine a recipe yeah. because there's going to be this layer of carbonation issues obscuring everything okay so it's a quality enhancement it's a quality enhancement as opposed to like cost avoidance yep yeah okay right. and i have another question yep uh, but does that variability in uh, the home brewers process mm -hmm. Like it was a lot of other processes, <coughs> go away in time with learning, experiential learning. Uh, uh, so, they, so they make a batch and, mm, okay, I don't like that that much, but I share it with my friends. I don't know if it's then they make another batch. And then, wouldn't you expect that over time, that through that experience and the learning with it, that they wouldn't need your product? Well, one thing we found, like across the board, is that uh, just by looking through forums and things like that, is there's just a level of un. Like I'm sureness of like what is actually in their beer. Mm -hmm. So they don't know how much yeast is actually in their beer. And even at like an advanced level, they still might not know. So uh, giving them this option allows them to be like 100% sure that they're getting the carbonation levels they want. Yeah, also going off of that, a normal home brewer will only brew like four times a year. They'll do like quarterly brews um, and it'll be like a social setting. A lot of um, new home brewers who are doing this as a hobby is just that it's just a hobby and they're not really looking to, to like learn all of these scientific things. Like if I were to do it, obviously I would, but um, they're not necessarily doing that. Yeah. And um, yeah. they're not necessarily making the same beer every time either. So they're not like honing in on brews. They're not professional brewers. Um, so if you're doing a different kind of beer every time, you're going to be needing different amounts of sugar. You're using different kinds of yeast. So you're getting different products out anyway. So there's there's a lot of variability. And though it does come with time that you like have more skills and you can reduce it slightly, there's like no way to actually reliably do that. Okay. When our novice home brewers graduate into being more experienced home brewers, and then a new generation of home brewers comes and takes their place. And home brewing as a art or craft is growing at home. Uh, I really like how you did the projections on three different numbers. That was smart. Um, does the include additive product like this have any oversight from the FDA? Is that an issue at all? Is that the thing? Probably. Cool. Uh, not something we've considered yet, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a factor. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, suppl supplements aren't regulated by the FDA, so. That is true. So, so no, this isn't necessarily being taken directly, and it's yeast and sugar, so. Yeah, we're not making something that is directly consumed, but we will look into it. Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're not taking Just the tablets. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, I'm going to piggyback on some of that. Um, so I had a couple questions, uh, and I feel like earlier in the project you had actually talked about this. Um, I didn't see anything about with the concentrations of yeast in your tablet, mm -hmm. like Lucas's tablet, how many milligrams? Yeah, so sugar. was that in there? Did I just uh, it's we have we didn't want to like overwhelm with super technical information right at the uh, get go, so we have 
um, mass okay. balances and stuff. But and but, did you, am I wrong that you were thinking about doing different yeast concentrations for different types of beer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Most, something we wanted to do in like our future plan. I think he mentioned earlier. Okay, yeah. you, you don't have to believe me. You don't yeah. have to speak yeah. things like Nick more complicated. So so the idea would be to have different product lines for different beer types. So you might have an IPA lager and uh, pale ale line, right. right? Which achieves 2.2 volumes of carbonation right. consistently, and then stout, 1.9 volumes right. of carbonation. But for the one that you've designed so far mm -hmm. is? It's for uh, like an average beer type, so 2.3 volumes of carbonation. Um, what's, what's an average? I, I get that, but what kind? Uh, like IPAs, okay. yeah. Yeah. pale ales. Uh, what about, uh, have you thought about the stability of the yeast tablet? Like how long? Stability? Oh. Like a shelf life. Yeah, so it's essentially the same as like active dry yeast. So, you know, bread yeast, it lasts like years um, or a year. Um, so we did think about it, but we uh, kind of uh, didn't go super in depth because active dry yeast like is an established product. Um, and since it's being stored separately from the sugar, uh, we kind of mitigated that risk of not being able to assess the stability. Sure, good yeah. answer. So who were who the home brewing experts? Uh, <laughs> so. Mostly Heather. <laughs> I have a little dabbling. Yeah, dabbling. I have friends. So. Uh, co-op Alex too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sam Adams, co-ops are helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Where's your sugar coming from? Uh, just corn sugar. You're just going to buy it in bulk and yep. then have a little Yep. Take a page uh, I out thought of so. I figured you kind of didn't talk about it, so yeah. I kind of figured that was a Take a page yeah. out of the uh, the pharma biosimilar like, yeah. rule book. <laughs> right. <laughs> buy and recombine. Yeah. Um, yeah, now I'm going to get more technical about some of the stuff. like. Uh, reaction time or how much it would mm -hmm. take for the yeast? Yeah, so, so the propagation is 48 hours, so two days. Okay. And then um, there's the eight hour flocculation period. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bit of downtime for cleaning and maintenance. I think that's like well, one to two hours or something. Yeah. And much. then that's why we have staggered reactors. Yeah. And then that allows us to, to grow. And then, you know, after we reach, say, that 7% figure of target market reach, we'd start looking at like a 10x scale up into like a 30 barrel uh, reactor, which is like a standard craft brew size. Right, right, right. Yep. I think we're good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>